And good morning, church. We want to say thank you for coming again today to study God's Word with me. Here we are today in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 4. You recall, I hope, that chapters 2 and 3 were spent addressing seven churches as Jesus reveals what he wants to say to those churches through his apostle John. The, the act of talking to those seven churches was not only to describe who Jesus was as he addressed them, but to describe the good things or the bad things about those churches, and then describe the result of their actions, whether they were going to be judged or they were blessed. Uh, there, there was only one really good church, and that was the church at Philadelphia. But in the end, we see that the book of Revelation has as a thread from beginning to end the, the judgment of God. It starts in the church, and here we come to chapter 4. When we get to chapter 6, it's going to really ramp up. We're going to see judgment all the way, almost all the way to the end of the book. But in chapters 4 and 5, it's like there's a pause in chapters 4 and 5, we're taken to heaven. Now, why would, why would God want to interrupt this flow of what he's going to do and how all this ends with a picture of heaven for us? I think it's obvious that we need to understand that God is still on the throne, that no matter how chaotic life looks or how overwhelmed we might be with the polit politics or finances of the modern age, God is still ruling sovereignly over his creation. Every promise he's made will take place. And today I was hoping to get through several verses, but I found myself only making it through three verses because of the profound nature of what we're going to learn today. I hope you can appreciate it with me. Here we are in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, and here's how it opens up. After this, I looked. That's John. Now, remember, we're looking at literature that is apocalyptic, literature that is very symbolic. We're going to try to understand each little piece, but we don't have to read a whole lot into it. We just want to see what is being said, and is there any obvious conclusion to what we're learning. So, Revelation 4.1, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Jesus has just said to the church at Laodicea, I stand at your door and I knock. Now we're transported to heaven. John sees a door. He sees a door. What kind of door? Well, it's an open door. All right? So we don't have to open it. It's already open. Where is it? It's in heaven. And it says that John is now going to see something that, you know, we'll see someday when we're glorified with the Lord. But the Lord brings John here first and he hears a voice, and the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So the ultimate conclusion of all the things we're going to be seeing from here out throughout is what's going to happen, what must take place. But we pause. We pause to see the throne of God. At once I was in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, that means John is transported to a dimension, I guess, that's not like ours. <laughs> He's in a heavenly place. He's being led by the Spirit. He's seeing what God wants to reveal to him. He's been transported out of time and space for this moment to understand what God is showing him. Okay, so he's in the Spirit. And what does he see? Behold, a throne. Now, I don't know if you watched this last weekend, but uh, King Charles got coronated, if that's a word, in, in the United Kingdom. The throne was a place where the power sat, right? All through history, we had kings, uh, particularly in Europe, kings that ruled, and they ruled with an iron fist in many cases, but the throne was the symbol of power. Well, now we're in heaven seeing the ultimate symbol of power, and that is the throne of God. So John sees a throne, and the throne is standing in heaven. All right, I, I don't know the symbolic nature of stood in heaven, but there it is. 
It's in heaven, and there's somebody seated. There's one seated on the throne. So God is occupying the central focus of power in heaven. He is the central focus of power. He is the one. Okay, so for you and I that are about to go through the chaos of chapter 6 all the way to the end of the book, we're, we're reminded right here that God is in heaven. God is on his throne. God is fully in charge of everything, no matter what circumstance you and I may face. No matter how evil the world might become, no matter what kind of Chaos would ensue from the wickedness in the heart of man. God is on his throne. Very important. That's the point. But now we see a little more. And he who sat there. Okay, so what are we being told? We're talking about the one, the Almighty, the Ancient of Days. God himself is sitting on this throne. Now we're being given what he looks like. Look at this. He had the appearance, notice that word, it's not telling us this is what God looks like. John is just able to discern this is what it appears to look like. I'm not sure what it really looks or what it really is, but here's what it looked like when I saw it, okay? The appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, I hope I'm saying that right. What are those? Those are gemstones. We're going to talk about those in a minute. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Okay, now I'm not a gemologist. Why is God using these gems to describe himself and to describe the area around his throne? Well, this is as far as I got today. Let's look at this. Let's start with Jasper. What is Jasper? I went and looked at Jasper. Jasper is a gemstone that could be many different kinds of colors. Some of it's red, some can be green, rarely, but sometimes it can be blue. Uh, if you look in your Bible and you pursue the idea of Jasper, you'll only find it in a few places. Exodus 28, Exodus 39, and Ezekiel 28. Uh, in Exodus 28, it's it's used in what's called the breast piece of judgment. It's a stone that represents the last tribe, Benjamin, of Israel. Okay, but that's what Jasper is. If you get all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, you are told in chapter 21 how Jasper fits into this scenario in the throne of God. We're given a different description. I want you to see it. In Revelation 21.10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. God has triumphed over his enemies. Uh, he rules. And now the new Jerusalem is descending. Watch what we're told here. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. So as this city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the holy city descends from heaven, John says, look, this is, this is full of the glory of God, the majesty of God, the overwhelming presence of God, and its radiance is like a very rare jewel. It's like that. I'm not telling you it is that, but it's like that. It's like a jasper, clear as crystal. Maybe this is like a diamond or some sort of stone that's absolutely clear. Jasper is described here as part of the city of Jerusalem. Okay, interesting, isn't it? This is the, the same thing that God describes himself as. Well, we look at the next one, carnelian. Here's a picture of carnelian. It's like a reddish stone. Remember, this is the description of the one who sits on the throne had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. Now, this stone was used by royals back throughout history. They would grind it up and they would make their seal out of carnelian. You know how they sealed letters? They didn't have those little uh, sticky backs on their letters where they could peel off the strip and then close the envelope. No, they would 
melt some of this, drip it on the back of their letter for a seal, and then stamp it so that you would understand that um, the king had sealed this message to whoever it was going to. Carnelian was used for that as well, and maybe there's significance to that. I don't know. As the letter proceeds, we're going to learn about the seals that are unsealed through the power of the Lamb of God. But remember, we're also told in Revelation 1-3 about what surrounds the throne, and it's emerald, right? Well, and we'll get to that in a second. Just look at this in Revelation 21 again. We saw that Jasper was there, and in this description, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was Jasper, then sapphire, third agate, fourth emerald. Notice emeralds there, fifth onyx, sixth carnelian. Again, this same stone is described as part of the wall of the city of Jerusalem. What's the significance of it? Again, this is the challenge of Revelation. How much should you read into it? How much should you just absorb what it's saying without reading into it? The main point I think we're being driven to, this throne and the one who sits on it is absolutely glorious, absolutely unimaginably marvelous, beyond description in power, beyond description in glory. Just something you and I could never even conceive of is the, is the power and the glory of God as he sits on his throne. All right, and we're told that around the throne, here we go, is emerald. Well, we're told it's a rainbow. Well, it looks green to me, right? I thought a rainbow was multicolored. But again, you have to understand, John is trying to describe to us what he is being shown, and in his impression of it, it looks like an emerald rainbow around the throne. Again, power. Again, majesty, glory is the description. Now, this isn't the only time heaven and the throne of God is described in Scripture. I want to take you to a few other places this morning before we quit. Isaiah 6. Think about this with me. Isaiah says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Here we go, back to the throne room of heaven. High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The throne is in the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with Two, he flew. These are creatures that we have no way to conceptualize. A six-winged creature that's flying above the throne of God. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Here's a picture of the throne room of God where the seraphim are ministering to the Lord and declaring his holiness. Again, majesty, power, glory. If we go to Ezekiel, we see another description. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne. Again, that's a, the same sort of imagery John uses in Revelation. This is what it looks like, kind of. But it wasn't exactly like that. Okay, There's the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with human appearance. Ezekiel seen uh, a man. Could this be the Lord Jesus? And up, upward from what he had, had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. So this wonderful, glorious person sitting in this throne is is like fire power fire would what also symbolize perhaps judgment right like the appearance of fire and clothes all around and downward from what had the appearance of his waist i saw as it were the appearance of fire and there was brightness around him i mean just unapproachable light 
Remember when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, he he had a brightness, a gloriousness that was basically indescribable. Ezekiel goes on, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain. What's that? That's a rainbow. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. He's describing what happened to him as he saw this. He saw the glory of God. Just unapproachable magnificence. That's the throne of God. That's what we're seeing in the book of Revelation. Daniel again, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Daniel sees wheels. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. Daniel's given a picture of the throne of God at judgment time. Incredible. What should we take away from all this, church? Well, we know God's in control. We know God's judgment is sure and true and right and coming. No matter what power evil seems to have in this day and age, God is in control and has defeated him already. It's just a matter of working it out. I want to take you back as we close today to the book of Hebrews. Remember this. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. God cannot be shaken. His throne is forever. And thus, let us offer to God. Here's what we're supposed to give him. Acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And what are we told in verse 29? For our God is a consuming fire. The picture we're seeing in Revelation is majestic. And there is so much more to be said about what John sees. But we'll get to that when we continue in chapter 4 tomorrow. God bless you, church. Serving well today. Lord,